Thanks so much for joining us. Ukraine's leaders are now calling for a meeting with Russia, and Germany's chancellor is scheduled to go to Moscow and Kiev this weekend to meet with Presidents Putin and Zelensky. The danger is clear. War could break out in Ukraine any day. President Biden spoke to both presidents this weekend. He vowed that the United States will respond swiftly with crippling economic sanctions against Russia if it invades. George Thomas reports from Lviv, Ukraine, near the border with Poland, where Ukrainians are preparing for the worst. 2014, when Russian-backed separatists invaded eastern Ukraine, thousands of folks fled west to cities like Lviv, and today, with the threat of another Russian invasion, authorities here and across western Ukraine are bracing for five million refugees. We've seen the images the past few weeks. Russia adding forces and military hardware, inching ever so close to surrounding their neighbor. While Ukrainians holding almost daily drills, ready to defend their country. And yet, an image you've not likely seen. Ukrainian Christians deploy their own weapon, a shield of prayer and worship. People are worried, but we encourage them to look to Jesus with all of our might, because it's only through prayer that we can keep peace in our country. 70% of Pastor Dimitrios' congregation is from eastern Ukraine, many of them escaping ongoing violence there. My heart right now is with my relatives I left behind in Donetsk. My mom, my sister and my grandmother, but they cannot leave this territory and it breaks me. With weekend talks between President Biden and Russia's President Vladimir Putin failing to calm growing tension, the White House continues to warn of major military action. We're in the window uh, when a Russian invasion can start at any time if President Putin so decides. That includes in the coming days. Foreign embassies, including the United States, moving staff here to Lviv, near the Polish border. And just as that's happening, in a small upper room near Lviv's city center, Christians from across Africa praying for their host country, ready to be hands and feet of Jesus to those who may have to flee. As Christians and as people of God, it's our job to, and it's our duty to pray for the whole world because the Lord wants peace. On the other side of town, area pastors met Sunday night for a time of planning and prayer, many telling CBN News what's at stake for their country. This is ultimately a fight for a freedom. Valery Marchenko's brother pastors a church in an eastern area occupied by Russian separatists. They are forbidden from having church meetings together, but they still do it secretly. And I think this is what will happen if Russia invades. But the truth is that it is impossible to stop the Church of Jesus Christ. And it's that church here in Lviv that's continuing to preach hope and peace in the midst of uncertainty. George Thomas, CBN News, Lviv, Ukraine. Well, George Thomas is now with us from Ukraine. So, George, the Ukrainians are asking for a meeting with the Russians. Uh, what, what do you expect the, the talk to be? Are, are they going to ask, are your troops just passing by? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Gordon. You know, uh, as you know, both Ukraine and Russia are members of uh, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation, the OSCE. About 57 uh, countries make up uh, this organization. And in fact, part of the organization's uh, uh, platform is that if one country feels that the other country is posing a military threat in any shape or form, that country has every right to uh, to present and ask the other country to say, hey, what's up? Why, why are you doing this? And exactly that's uh, uh, Ukraine's foreign minister says I, he wants to have a meeting with his counterpart in Russia to say, hey, what's up with these 130,000 troops that are massing around our border? What are your intentions? What do you plan to do? Well, the list of countries urging citizens to evacuate immediately, it's growing by the day. How real is the threat of invasion? 
uh, just like the White House said, uh, from uh, uh, from the White House National Security to the to our State uh, Department representative Anthony Blinken, uh, to uh, Prime Minister uh, Johnson, who said, "Look, we are at a tipping point. The all indications uh, are that." Russia is ready. They've got all the equipment, all the forces ready to pounce uh, on Ukraine. And uh, as uh, Secretary Blinken said in my piece, it could be a matter of days. Well, you've been on the ground several days in Ukraine. So how are people handling this? What's the atmosphere like? Gordon, it, it really is a stark contrast. I arrived, as you mentioned, a couple of days ago in Kiev, the capital city. And a sense of fear, uh, trepidation, people uh, going to the stores, uh, 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 you know, getting their supplies, uh, food, and so forth. But, you know, the reality, the, the malls were packed, the streets were busy, the cafes, the restaurants were busy. Uh, and as I talked to people, not just in Kiev, but in Kharkiv, in Donbass, in Mariupol, and here in Lviv, they say to me, George, we've been dealing with war uh, for the last eight years. You journalists just appeared on the scene in the last two, three weeks. The reality is that we have lived under the threat, under war for the last eight years in the East. Uh, uh, but clearly, there is a sense, Gordon, just since uh, President Biden announced last week uh, that, uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, personnel need to get out of the country, there's been a shift in the, uh, in the mood in the country here. And uh, people are beginning to say, wow, uh, what really are Russia's intentions? And what is the reason for them to even think about invading our beloved country? Well, George, thanks for the eyewitness account, and please stay safe. Well, in other news, products are once again moving by truck across the Ambassador Bridge from Canada to Detroit, but the protest isn't over. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The free flow of goods comes as a result of police clearing the blockade on the Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario. After days of protests that brought the crossing to a standstill and disruptions at some U.S. auto plants, police moved in, arresting some protesters and towing trucks. It's part of a nationwide trucker protest against COVID restrictions in Canada. Some provinces are scaling back or dropping requirements. Meanwhile, another blockade is forming in Buffalo at the Peace Bridge into Canada. And there are reports trucker protests could spread here to the United States. Last week, the Department of Homeland Security issued a bulletin warning of a potential convoy from California to Washington, D.C. between mid-February and mid-March. Well, the Los Angeles Rams are Super Bowl champions after a thrilling come-from-behind victory over the Cincinnati Bengals. Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford threw the winning touchdown pass to wide receiver Cooper Cup, who was the game's most valuable player. After the game, Cup, who's known for his strong Christian faith, said God had given him a vision after a previous Super Bowl loss. In 2019, we walked off the field that last, uh, that last time after losing to the Patriots. I wasn't able to be a part of that thing. But I don't know what it was. There's just this vision that God revealed to me that we were going to come back. We were going to be a part of a Super Bowl. We were going to win it. And, uh, and somehow, somehow, I was going to walk off the field as the MVP of the game. What an incredible vision. Gordon? Catches, the most receiving yards, the most touchdowns during the season. Only four players have earned the NFL's coveted triple crown. Well, now Los Angeles Rams superstar Cooper Cup has added MVP of the Super Bowl to his accolades. Sports reporter Tom Buring sat down with Cooper, Cooper long before the big game to find out what makes him a number one playmaker. A game can provide a remarkable emerging journey, even at a distance. It has for Cooper Cup. The Rams' playmaking receiver is shaped by bloodlines from Yakima, Washington's first family of football, three NFL generations worth, while setting multiple college career records from Eastern Washington before making an immediate NFL impact in Los Angeles. So Coop, your offensive awareness has almost made you a quarterback whisperer, chemistry with your quarterback. What's most important to you about earning trust? Huge. Us to ask the quarterback to sit back there in the pocket knowing that there's guys bearing down on him. Him just being able to trust that we're going to be at the right spot at the right time, I think is everything in terms of that relationship. And if we're not doing that, you know, that's when you know, things got to go off schedule. Now you're asking our quarterback to you know, have to make a play because we're off as receivers. Football's a game about game speed. How do you prepare yourself? 
to what that requires. Yeah, well, I think it's just practice. Um, our approach to practice, I think, is paramount. You know, we always say that practice preparation equals game reality. Exactly what we want it to be in terms of our, our tempo and our focus going into that and just being able to execute. And you know, we get to the game, we step on the field on Sunday, we've already performed this over and over again during practice. So much about football is preparation. I mean, you go out there on Sunday with a quiet in mind, be able to just play the game that you've prepared all week for. Does the tempo and rhythm of football heighten your awareness just translating into life? I mean, you're a dad now, you've got no choice probably by that, right? <laughs> it's interesting because I feel like, you know, sometimes you come into work and you gotta be laser focused all the way through. And that in another way, it's nice to, be able to go home and be like, oh, well, I don't have to be like that right now. But yeah, we do have a one-year-old now, so uh, I get the 24-7 uh, training experience. Looking back now, storied, record-setting career at Eastern Washington, how did that prepare you for the NFL? Going to Eastern, I had coaches that came around me that never let me become complacent with anything. Yes, this is good, but this is how you can be better. It was just calling me to something greater than I'm seeing for myself. Look at how much better you can be if you can fix these things and get in there and say, well, this was good, how can I be better? Your family, the Cups are now just the fifth to have three generations drafted in the NFL playing the game. Your dad as a former quarterback, your granddad as a former lineman. What kind of support did that give you? Uh, I mean, it's been incredible to have uh, such experience to lean on and just uh, perspective. I think how much they love their family, how much they took care of things, how they treated people. I'm now being able to live out my dream, but I have such bigger things happening in my life that are beyond football. As much as I absolutely love football and know like, I'm gonna put everything I have into it, that I've got a family at home, and my faith in Christ as well, that just is more important to make sure that's healthy. That's something that my, you know, my dad and grandpa showed me. The ACL tear, what did you learn about yourself? You never would have seen by the waiting, the wondering, and the rehabbing. Uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of lessons I think I learned through this, but I think if I pinpoint down, it's that I can't do this by myself. The first thing that comes to mind is just the spiritual battle that goes on when something like this happens. Just reactively is why, you know, what caused this to happen? I needed God, I needed to trust in what my faith was, just having my wife and son to be able to push me. The teammates, the coaching staff, the training staff, strength staff, I mean, I just had a team around me that encouraged me, you know, really showed me how important it was to have people around me that God's really placed in my life, seeing how much of a blessing that is. Faith is a huge part of that. You know, our faith is that, uh, you know, that we're not number one. That we're not the number one focus of our lives, and it's others, and it's it's Christ first, and then it's others, you know, starting with the closest people to you. I know he knows there's purpose in everything, and he'll look back and know that he's grown from it, and he's a stronger person, and hopefully he can help someone else down the road that goes through the same thing. All right, hey, it's a great Rams win today. Great day for the Rams, great day for Coops. You are referred to as a playmaker, altering a game, impacting a game. Off the field, you ever consider Jesus Christ being a playmaker in lives? He might just be the greatest playmaker that's ever lived. Restoration, redemption, sacrifice, what he laid on the line to change the world forever. You can't find a better playmaker than Jesus Christ. Coop, who is he to you? I don't think there's words to really at the very basic levels of my life as a husband, as a father, football player, knowing how much of a failure I am at these things. If it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for knowing that Christ has told me who I am in his eyes, and know that no matter how far short I fall on all these things, that he's bridged every gap and that he's called me to even greater things. And he's called you to even greater things, that the price he paid for you, who you are in his eyes is the most important thing in life. When you realize that you're worth the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you, that his sacrifice gives you value, what he was looking at from the cross. The scriptures say that when he offers his soul as a sacrifice for sin, he shall see his descendants and his soul will be satisfied. Isn't that amazing?
that Jesus saw you from the cross and the decisions, the life that you would lead for him would satisfy him. It's the greatest story the world has ever heard. Here is Cooper Cup. He's now MVP of the Super Bowl. He's at the, you know, the height of his profession, uh, the height of a lot of uh, what people dream about. But he says, without him, I'm a failure. I can't be a husband. I can't be a father. I can't be a football player. He enabled me to come back from an ACL tear. He enabled me to have a community surrounding me. For you right now, whatever you're going through, just bow your head and ask that very simple prayer. It's the same thing that Cooper Cup did, same thing I did. Jesus, without you, I can't do this. But with you, I can do all things. If you're discouraged, if you're wondering about the future, if you have trouble in your heart, turn to him. He is the answer to every human need. And when you come to that realization, you see it, just as Cooper saw it, that without him, you can do nothing, but with him, you can do all things. That his sacrifice gives you meaning. It gives you purpose. It gives you value. You're worth it. When you come to that, you come to the greatest revelation anyone can ever have. And you can stand on this earth and see it you can have this. You can have a relationship with your creator. How do you get it? It's real simple. You bow your head. You acknowledge him. You say it out loud. Jesus, could you come into my heart? I see what you've done for Cooper. I've seen what you've done for other people. Could you do that for me? Could you transform me? Could you come into my heart, my life? If you pray that with all of your heart, the Bible's very clear. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. If you want help with this prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. Just tell the person on the other end of the line, I need Jesus. I need to have him in my life, and I need it today. We've also got a free packet for you called A New Day. In it is a teaching of what do Christians believe? How do you live the Christian life? How do you know if your sins are forgiven? I'll explain to you. Um, it's absolutely free. No financial obligation at all. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, today is February 14th, Valentine's Day, and our own Chris Mitchell is about to share a love story very dear to his heart. It's about a couple whose letters to each other kept their love alive when the winds of war swept over the world in the 1940s. That couple was my parents. For more than 50 years, my mother, Ann Jean, kept the letters written to her by my father, Mitch, during World War II, before they were married. My mother saved more than 70 letters she received during their three years of separation when he served in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. Lieutenant Mitch Mitchell served in the Army's 54th Medical Battalion, setting up field hospitals and getting ambulances to the front lines. For his service, he was awarded the Bronze Star. Mitch began most of his letters with Dearest A.J. They echoed whispers of love from a bygone era. The handwritten letters and notes were hidden in the closet, stuffed in a shoebox, and locked in her heart. They held the aroma of romance, the sounds of war, and the pain of parting. Anne Jean A.J. Mitchell slipped into eternity on March 28, 2002, three years after her husband Mitch of 53 years. Of all the earthly belongings left behind by this wife, mother, and grandmother, the most treasured were these letters which tell their story. Well, my three siblings and I didn't know about those letters until my mom passed away in 2002. You know, they reveal a little known but profound chapter in the lives of our mom and dad. And that's why we've compiled them, all these letters, in a book called Dearest AJ. Terry? 
Oh, Chris, it's such a sweet book. I read it last night and was thinking how different the world was then. You and your siblings didn't know about the letters until after your parents were gone. What were your first thoughts when you read what your dad wrote in those letters? Well, some of the first thoughts, Terry, is what a family treasure this is that was locked up for literally 50 years uh, after the war. And, you know, the, the love story that we saw, the letters themselves were sort of like the notes to their love song. First of all, for, for the guys, my brothers, Kevin and, and, uh, and uh, Kevin and Brian, we didn't know our dad could be so dreamy. Here's a, here's a couple of examples. This is from February 22nd, 1944, appropriate on Valentine's Day. He said, the mail just came in and I received a Valentine. Honey, I was unable to send one, but you are my Valentine with all my heart. Here's another from February 21st, 1945. He says, darling, I do love you so I get a lump in my throat just looking at your picture. And so for, for the guys anyway in the family, we didn't see he could be uh, so romantic, but they were a treasure, uh, a family treasure. And what they said to us, uh, uh, Terry, is that, you know, even during the deepest part of the war, it was these letters that kept live, love alive. And uh, as they go in the absence uh, for them did make the heart grow fonder and the letters were what made it happen. Were there themes in the letters as you read them that your mom and dad carried over as they raised their family? Your family's always been really close. They have been close. And I think uh, it, you could say it was the epitaph on their grave. They're buried in Cape Cod National Cemetery right beside each other on the family. The gravestone is says faith, family and friends. Uh, all the way through the letters, you can see there was their faith in God that kept their, their hope alive, that they would actually uh, get together. There's one letter. This is on June 26, 1944. Darling, every day that passes is a day closer to you. Let's hope and pray that God will hasten the end. We'll write tomorrow, all my love, Mitch. And, uh, and that it was their faith in God that kept them alive, uh, you know, through this time. It was also uh, family. Family, as you said, has been very close. Uh, and it, we see that through the letters. They're talking about uh, their moms and dads, sisters and brothers. You know, in our family, we've had a family reunion that's uh, been nearly 40 years. And that was a legacy that our mom and dad brought us. And uh, also, and I, I would say that this is not just a letter from me. I wrote the book, but it's really a family story from my brothers, uh, Kevin and Brian, my sister Jean, our relatives, our cousin, all those that knew lo and loved Mitch and AJ. It's really a story we hope that can inspire other people uh, during this time. And finally, friends. Friends are always very important. You see in his letters, there was one particular friend that uh, our dad had called Dr. Finnan. Seemed to be quite a character, a uh, very funny guy, even in the midst of war. And friends, close friends, have always been part of the legacy of our mom and dad and even our family. And I would say also, Terry, you know, really these letters are the lost art of letter writing. Uh, people don't do that anymore in our social media driven world. But uh, these are the 1940s version of You've Got Mail. Well, <laughs> it was just a view of the greatest generation that was really fun to read. And you so creatively took those letters from the time your dad went into the army and kind of wove in the front of the book how, how history unfolded during the time that he was in the military and the time that he wrote these letters to your mom. Do you have a favorite? I have three, if I can. Yep. First of all, May 8, 1943, he's on his way to North Africa. He's on a troop transport, and he says this to AJ, arrive safely somewhere in North Africa. When this messed up world settles down, we're still in a messed up world, Terry. I will be able to tell you the fullest details, the episodes of my travels. And through the book, as you've read, you know, you can talk about when he was in North Africa. He was on D-Day, the invasion of Sicily. He served under General George S. Patton. He got malaria in, uh, in, uh, in Sicily. He recovered, joined his unit, went up to the uh, to Italian campaign. He had a small sort of saving Private Ryan story, got reunited with his brother Tom. He ended up at the end of the war in Cortina de Panza, a jet set uh, place. And, uh, and then he comes back to AJ wondering what is she going to think when she finally sees him. And then my next favorite, uh, Terry, is November 20th, 1946. It's sort of a bookend of all the letters. They're married now. They get married in 1944. And he says this. My darling wife, I thought it would be proper and nice for me to be the sender of the first letter to you in our new home. What <laughs> memories are running through my mind of the places I used to be and how far away you were when writing to you and how close you are now. 
I wish so much for you and me, and I hope God will be good to us and protect and bless our home. I desire your happiness so much. So, my darling, I wish you all the best in our new home, your loving husband. And finally, Terry, AJ wrote the, the last letter in the book. After Mitch, her love for 53 years had died, he, she writes this letter and she says, Dear Chris, I used to wonder what life would be like without you. I know how empty it can be. I think of you every day, all day and into the night. Weren't we lucky to find one another and loved each other so much? I was always happy that you loved me. So those three letters to me sum up Mitch and AJ, their life and their love, their love of God and love of each other. But it's a precious story, a precious, precious picture into their relationship and interesting to see all of the history that they lived through at that time. The book is called Dearest AJ and it is available wherever books are sold. Well done, Chris Mitchell. You've honored your parents well. Thank you, Terry. Graphic photos, intimate texts. Jason Gray kept everything you could imagine on his cell phone. Then one day he left his phone behind before leaving on a trip. His wife unlocked it and triggered a bomb that the couple now call the epic event. I was helpless and just listening to Tanasha just in agonies, you know, go through the phone and, and, and really asking questions. And at that moment, I was in fear of our marriage at that point because it's like now, what do I do? I'm busted. Tanasha Gray thought her marriage with Jason was strong until one day in 2014, when he accidentally left his phone in her car before boarding a plane to Trinidad. He later borrowed a phone to call her. She asked me for the password, which I was very reluctant to give her the password. And then when she opened up the phone, I heard a scream. That's when everything came crashing. On the phone were text messages and graphic photos of Jason with other women. My initial reaction was utter shock. I felt like emotionally I passed out. I just knew my world was crumbling. All of my indiscretions, everything, I saved everything on my telephone. Uh, pictures, everything was there. Text messages, I didn't delete anything. Just what you could imagine was on that phone was on that telephone. Jason had grown up in the church and lived an outwardly Christian life, which was attractive to Tanasha when they first began dating. I lived in New York and he lived in Florida at the time, but I did not have a, a thought that he would not be faithful. He went to church, he paid his tithes, he seemed like a great contributing member to society. I felt a connection. I really felt like she was the one. She was very ambitious. And so that was one of the things that really attracted me to her, not only just her looks, but her intellect. The couple had three sons and were happy for many years. But after what they now refer to as the epic event, their marriage was in crisis. During the 10 years we got married, I didn't have any sexual relationships with any women, but I had a lot of emotional relationships and I had a lot of inappropriate conversations leading up to the epic event. Now the epic event happened after I met my affair partner back in 2014. And that, of course, the epic event exposed everything else that was going on in my life at the time. On the day when I dropped Jason off at the airport, I had a good feeling, even before I got home, that this phone has the answers. There are some things that's locked up in here that I need to get into it. Jason had three days to think before he returned from Trinidad. When I arrived home, the first thing I did was drop to my knees and ask for her forgiveness. Uh, I was filled with all sorts of emotion, and what really hurt me was to see how she was responding to all of this, because here I am, the love of her life, the person that she put on a pedestal, and I betrayed her trust. I mean, I not only betrayed her, but I went and I ran through the wall of trust with a, with a semi-truck. I just truly said to him, I can't help you. I know someone who can. His name is Jesus. Here is, here's a journal, here's a book, here's a pen. Please, there's a room upstairs. Go meet with God. I Jason spent the next week in their spare room fasting and praying. Uh, I had no distractions. I did a lot of reading, and I, I felt the presence of the Lord in that room. So I really had a, a really strong encounter because I completely surrendered. The healing process was challenging and took time. I felt like I needed a good understanding of what happened. 
because I, I needed to put the pieces together. I'm, how did this all occur? Like why, when, how, with who, when? Just every question in the book. She was angry. She hated me at times. And it was tough. And there was times where I wanted to walk away from the marriage. And I felt like there was times that she tried to push me away to see what I was made of. God was working on Tanasha's heart also. I knew she was praying for me regardless of if the marriage was going to survive or not, just for my own well-being, because that's what she does. I knew that I had to forgive Jason. I did it out of obedience to God. And once I did it, I fell free. And we continued the journey of going to counseling. I said to him, I forgive you. And you have a clean slate. Do whatever you want to do with it. Jason humbly received the grace given to him and is totally committed to Tanasha. The couple later wrote a book about their experiences. It was a long journey to reconciliation. It really took us going to many different classes. Jason did a conquer series with men that dealt with addiction. And then together we did a marriage for life group with other couples. We did a lot of work, plus we were committed to just talking. Today, their marriage is stronger than ever. They also host a weekly marriage podcast together to help other couples address the roots of their problems before it's too late. Don't give up. God can restore anything if you're willing to work at it. And Tanasha always says that it takes two, but it starts off with one person. And that's, that's always been our testimony. Spending time together, quality time, making that time to connect is what I would advise couples to stand firm and be unmovable about those date nights. Keep going, don't stop, don't stop connecting and be true to the process of healing, growing. That's what we believe for other couples and we've seen it in our own lives. It is a journey and marriage takes three really. The closer you get to God, the closer you stay to each other. You know, one of the things that that made this possible, this healing, was that Jason came home humbly. The other thing was that Tanasha decided that she would forgive. And you know, forgiveness can feel like such a wrong choice in the middle of something that's been so hurtful. But she knew what the Word of God had to say. She knew how God had forgiven her, all of us, when we didn't deserve it. And so she said, I chose to forgive. That doesn't mean her warm, fuzzy feelings were all wrapped around that choice. It means she settled in and said, I'm, I'm going to do the right thing here. I'm going to do what God has spoken to me to do, not what he deserves, not looking at what's been done to me. I'm going to make the right choice for me. So she chose to forgive. And then they talked about the hard work they put in, because to restore something that's been broken takes some work, doesn't it? And it doesn't just happen because you've decided you want to hang in there for a while. You've got to do some work to put things back together, and then you've got to have some, some plan, a plan for where you're going as a couple, where she said at the end, don't forsake those date nights, work your plan, <laughs> keep it going. Everything in the world wants to pull us apart from each other, wants to challenge the vows and the commitment that we've made. But God comes into the middle of that and he takes our mess and he gives us a message if we'll give it to him. He gives us a start over. You know, that's such a, such a unique thing to walking with Christ to me. And the start over, you know, isn't without its, its dents and its scars and its bumps. But along the way, sometimes what you have is more real because of all of that. You've worked through life. You've worked through the junk. You've worked through the things that have challenged your relationship. Don't walk away from something that was awesome enough for you to make a lifelong commitment to it just because the going got tough or just because one of you was unfaithful. It is redeemable, but you both have to be willing to redeem it. That is always God's way. It's always his desire to see us whole, to see us healed. If you'd like to speak to someone about a need in your own marriage today, 
you can call our toll-free number. It's always available, and there's always someone on the other line who's, who's not going to be a marriage counselor, but they're going to tell you what God has to say about it. They're going to share from the scriptures, and they're going to pray with you. Our number's toll-free. It's 1-800-700-7000, and ask them for this. We have this pamphlet called Love and Marriage, and we'd love to just share it with you. It's free, just like the phone call's free. So call now and ask for the Love and Marriage pamphlet, and don't get off the phone without asking someone to pray with you specifically. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The growth in the number of religious people around the world is outpacing the number of new non-religious people. That's among the findings from a survey by Massachusetts-based Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. The number of people from all religions is growing at just over one and a quarter percent a year, while the growth rate of people who aren't religious is slightly more than half a percent. And the number of new atheists is even lower, below one-fifth of a percent annually. Well, CBN continues to grow online in Hong Kong through a Cantonese language version of the 700 Club. The program features life-changing testimonies and can be viewed on YouTube and Facebook. Last year, the YouTube channel reported several videos receiving more than 100,000 views. One popular testimony tells the story of a gambling addict redeemed through the gospel. Additionally, the program's Facebook viewership doubled over the course of 2021. One viewer shared, thank you for the testimony videos and please keep it up. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Well, Jacob and Charlie were on a mission. This military couple were serious about getting out of debt. They were making good progress when they were hit by a major setback. Both their cars broke down and needed repairs. Well, here's how you came to their rescue. Marine Corporal Jacob was deployed so often, he and wife Charlesy spent less than a year together during their first three years of marriage. Charlesy will never forget the homecomings. When they release them, it's like this mad, you know, looking through all the faces, they're all in camis, you know, like, okay, which one's mine, where is he? And I had to check his name tape, make sure that one's mine before I just kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> when Jacob returned from his most recent deployment, they decided Charlesy wouldn't work so they could start a family and have her stay at home. However, both were concerned about their growing credit card debt. The joy of being back together was dampened by the weight of, wow, okay, we have, we've got debt and it's growing. We looked at it, we were like, wow, that hurts. That was kind of our wake up call. We came together and we were like, we can't do this. We need to learn the skills, apply them, pulling ourselves out of this hole. They cut out everything unnecessary, including internet and cable. Jacob started looking for a second job, and Charlesy went to food banks to avoid buying groceries on the credit card. It's something that we feel together that we need to do in order to honor the Lord the best way we can so that we're not slave to the lender. Their get out of debt plan derailed when both of their older cars simultaneously needed major repairs. They considered scaling down to one car, but Charlesy was an active volunteer at church, so they needed two. Right now, fixing the issues with either car is, it can't be the top of our priority list. There are other bills and, and needs that um, come before doing that. When Pillar Church learned about their financial challenges, they contacted Helping the Homefront. We agreed to help. Pastor Mike Young invited the couple over to tell them CBM was paying off their credit card debt. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what to say. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that is incredible. Pastor Mike had another surprise. As of today, the local Toyota dealership is waiting to take both your cars in. And through the generous uh, offering of CBN, they would like to pay for all the repairs necessary to take care of that, <laughs> to get that off of your plate. I can't handle this right now. <laughs> Both of the cars. Both of them. I have no idea what to say. <laughs> it's a new day every day. Joy comes in the morning, and uh, we pray that this is the morning you've been waiting for. Oh, my goodness. I can't. I... <laughs> this is just incredible. <laughs> this is incredible. Pastor Mike took the couple to the Toyota dealership to get both vehicles fixed. With their cars in good working order and their debt paid, Jacob and Charlesy can focus on building their savings for their family's future. 
CBN's helping the home front changed our life. I'm so grateful to CBN and all the partners. We are very thankful for what helping the home front has just given us. It's going to be resonating with us for a very long time for the rest of our lives. Well, happy Valentine's Day to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that wonderful gift to that wonderful couple to say, here, we want to help you. We want to help you get out of debt. We want to help you repair your cars. We want to help you because of your service to our country. This is all part of our program called Helping the Home Front, where we recognize active duty military. Their whole family is serving. It's not just the service member. We want to thank them for their service, but we also want to thank the family. And we want to be there when they are having financial difficulty, when they're having trouble. We want to let them know that we care. We love them. We want to be of service to them. If you want to be a part of this, it's real simple. All you have to do is pick up the phone and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Here's the number to call. 1-800-700-7000. Now, how much is it to join? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. At whatever level, when you call and join, I've got a gift for you. I want you to have this. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. He's had over 60 years in ministry guided by the Holy Spirit, praying over decisions for CBN, getting direction from the Holy Spirit on what to do next. Uh, it'll guide you how you can get answers to life's problems, how you can get guidance. Uh, it's yours when you call and join. So do it now, 1-800-700-7000. Now, if you want to designate your gift to Helping the Home Front, it's real easy. Just say, I want to give to Helping the Home Front. Uh, when you call or you can write to us, Helping the Home Front, put that on the memo line of the check and send it to CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Or you can text Home Front to 71777 or on the giving page at CBN.com. You can designate your gift. There's a place where you can designate your gift to Helping the Home Front. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Valentine's Day. Some people love it. Others dread it. Either way, most people think of it as a celebration of romance with flowers, candy, cards. In reality, Valentine's Day is rooted in something totally different. For many people, Valentine's Day is all about romance. If you may ask the person in the street, what does Valentine's Day mean to you? All it means is heart-shaped boxes of chocolates and a nice dinner with your, with your beloved and, and sending cards and so forth. And then if they did know about a St. Valentine, they probably wouldn't realize that he was a priest in the late third century in Rome who was actually martyred for the faith. Very often, legends will develop from real facts. There's that little phrase in, in J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings where he says, uh, history became legend and legend became myth. The legend of St. Valentine is a story that is rooted in fact. There are three stories surrounding him, and they all agree on a number of issues. It seemed that he was born in 226 in a tiny little city called Terni in Umbria in Italy, and that he was either a priest or a bishop. Valentine apparently lived during the reign of the Emperor Claudius II. He's sometimes referred to as Claudius Gothicus. Now, this emperor did not reign for very long, maybe a year and a half. Rome at this point in time was really a cesspool of immoral behavior. Pedophilia was rife. Sexual promiscuity was rife. And, and one of the great witnesses of the early church is that they stood up for the value of a godly marriage where uh, sexuality was channeled into its God-given um, boundaries and it would become a witness of what enduring love could look like. During his reign, Claudius issued an edict that made marriage illegal. There was an invasion of Goths towards Rome, and they needed a lot of people to go to war. And it seemed that the rule was that once you were married, you were given freedom not to go to war. And um, Valentine would not only convert the people, but secretly marry them so that they could indeed stay at home. Valentine was arrested and brought to Rome. 
While he was being held captive, he presented the gospel to his jailer, the judge Asterius. So the judge said to him, well, if this indeed is true, I want you to prove it. And he brought one of his adopted daughters who happened to be blind, the one legend says. And what happened is that Valentinus, or Valentine here, laid his hands upon this girl, and she was healed immediately. Another legend says that before he was executed, he left a note for the girl signed, Your Valentine. Some say this led to the practice of sending Valentines on February 14th, the day he was beheaded. All the legends seem to agree that uh, Valentine was martyred on the 14th of February in 269. Therefore, that was the day associated with him when the church would celebrate and, and thank God for his life. So Valentine's Day didn't start out as a romantic holiday. We do need to recognize that this day, the 14th of February, was already connected with Valentine from the fourth century, already from that time onward. And right from the beginning, this celebration had more to do than just a celebration of romantic love. And the church's commitment to Valentine to honor this example of Christian marriage and sacrifice and martyrdom and the healing of other people and the spread of the gospel was from the beginning a commitment to what Christian marriage could be like in our world and the message that it brings to a broken world. Valentine's Day represents more than flowers and candy. It's about what's in our hearts and the heart of Christ. When we see those hearts on Valentine's Day, we can remember that that heart is, also has some connections back to the heart of Jesus and to God's love for us. And we can remember that the source of all love and the source of self-sacrifice and, and love for each other is rooted in God's love uh, and, in the, and in the witness that St. Valentine actually made for that love. For Christians, Marriage is more than just a union between a man and a woman. For Christians, marriage is a holy parable of the love of Christ towards His church. It's a visible sermon about what holiness and purity could look like in our lives. We should celebrate what true sacrificial love looks like in a broken world. And ultimately, it should be a day that we celebrate the commitment of Christ who gave His life for His church. It should be a day of evangelism. It should be a day where we celebrate the power of true love to change our world. It is a Christian holiday. It is a very Christian holiday, and let us this Valentine's Day remember St. Valentine, that he gave his life for the sacrament of marriage. He was prohibited from marrying couples, and he went ahead and did that and gave his life for that. And in that, uh, recognize the sacrament, that marriage is a holy institution. In today's hookup culture, in today's culture where we're surprised when marriages last, let's celebrate marriage and let's celebrate the commitment that we have on Valentine's Day. Here's a word from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's my favorite part of the Bible. Love never fails and it won't fail you, especially on Valentine's Day. God bless, we'll see you tomorrow.